my wife says, what's that old man doing down on the five-yard line there? Isn't that against the rules? Why don't they penalize him? And I said, we wouldn't be sitting here watching this game if it wasn't for that old man. In 1920, I met with 10 other owners in an automobile showroom in Canton, Ohio, to form this organization, which is now known as the National Football League. We had great confidence in our game even then, but none of us realized that professional football would achieve the great popularity that it has today. He is the one that had the foresight to turn semi-pro football into a league. Old timers would tell me of the days when Hallis, the coach, owner of the Chicago Bears, would write his press releases and come up to the newspaper offices begging for a couple of paragraphs saying that the Bears were playing on Sunday. And here's some tickets, bring your family. Few families were interested. Hallis changed all that in 1925 when he signed All-American halfback Red Grange to star in a barnstorming tour of 17 cities in 66 days. When the tour was over, the NFL had gained legitimacy. He brought in Red Grange at a time when the league needed a big-name person. Fans were willing to come out and see the Bears, even though they didn't know much about professional football at that stage. With Hallis coaching, recruiting, and wooing the press, the Bears began to win before large crowds. In his 40 seasons as head coach, Hallis won 324 games and six NFL titles. Never happy with the status quo, he taught quarterback Sid Luckman the T formation. The T formation and the man in motion was the Chicago Bears. That's what set them apart. They didn't play the old style single wing offense. They opened the game up. Hallis used the T formation in the 1940 title game against Preston Marshall's Washington Redskins, beating them so convincingly that not a coach in America could ignore the strategy. When they beat the Washington Redskins 73 to nothing, every team in football, pro, college and high school all went to the T formation a tireless innovator Hallis introduced scouting reports game films and the spy in the sky he even utilized the halftime marching band as a form of psychological warfare he would do anything to distract the other team i wouldn't put anything past him i used to say that you were joe tap the telephone lines from the press box to the bench. An airplane would fly over practice field. We'd all look up and say, I bet that's Hallis spying on our practice. Lombardi loved Hallis. In those days at Lambeau Field, both teams used our lockers. And we come back up after warm-up, there's a knock on the equipment door, and Hallis is standing in the doorway. And Coach Lombardi says, yes, Coach, can I help you? And he said, Vince, I just want to tell you one thing. You better have your team ready because we're going to kick your ass. And Vince is left there flabbergasted. What the hell did he say that for? And he admitted to me, he said, you know, later on, it hit me. He got me thinking about that statement. I wasn't thinking about the game. Hallis was an all-around athlete himself, a basketball and football star at Illinois, an MVP in the Rose Bowl. He was player coach for the Bears franchise from 1920 to 1929. He was the son of immigrants from Bohemia, and I think loved sports in part because it was a level playing field. It was a way where anybody could get out there and show what he had versus the other guys. And he brought to football a real passion and a zest and a, and a love of competing, a love of winning. Hallis said he could measure passion by the hardness of a player's nose or his taste for blood. Under his command, the Bears wreaked havoc on the lead. The New York Freshy foots them as the monsters of the midway. And I remember one writer saying, gee, I think Hallis takes those guys and hits them in the face with rocks every week before they come off the field. I think George delighted or not that, that they were ferocious and that they could maybe intimidate the other teams. He had the players intimidated. He had the officials intimidated. I remember one time we were track back blocking on a guy named Bill Wyken, who's a defensive end. So he come off the field and Hallis is screaming at him and kicked him right in the ass. Right in front of 47,000 people. When we would lose football games, we would practice on the armory field, which was full of horse manure. And he'd go there and say, well, you played like this, you might as well practice in it. He was a pioneer. He was a visionary. But, you know, the George Hallis I saw was just 
A mean-spirited, tight wad. They made a tough dollar in Chicago, and, and he demanded return on the money he paid. Mike Ditka said, uh, George Hallis throws around half dollars like manhole covers. He said, I'm going to pay you this, and, and you were happy to get it, really. You might argue about it a little bit in your mind, but you were still happy to get it. He said, you know, kid, they don't come to see you. They come to see Gail Sears. Now, you know, what you're asking here is really out of line. And then in talking to Gail, he'd say the same thing. He says, you know, Gail, they come to see Dick. They don't come to see you. He came up from those days when it was a very fight for survival. When players would make a hundred bucks for playing in a game, and Hallis had to scramble to come up with the money to pay him. He's like my parents and people that grew up in the Great Depression. The wolf was at the door, and I think that's what made Hallis what he was. He was strong, unbending, and yet, in here, a lot of people didn't realize what a softy he was. I could run through a wall for George Hallis because, you know, I, I know what he did for so many people off the field. I know when, when Brian Piccolo got, got sick, uh, uh, his hospital bills were short time that he was sick. He came to over $500,000. So the man took care of the whole thing. Many times he made my concerns his own. I love George Hallis, and I'm not, you know, afraid to say that. And as the years went on, he became more and more charming. One time after a game, Hallis walked up to the referee that day and just he really laid into him and here were two nice little ladies waiting for for Hallis's autograph and without breaking stride he turned around and said ah ladies nice to see you and did you enjoy the game after winning the NFL title in 1946 the Bears didn't win again for 16 years in 1963 Hallis got his last hurrah when his monsters of the midway beat the New York Giants for Chicago's eighth NFL title He'd been criticized as being too old for the game, the game having passed him by, and this was proof that that was not true. Hallis retired after the 1967 season. Five coaches and 15 seasons later, he found a coach that embodied the Chicago Bears spirit. The Papa Bear died in 1983, two years before the Bears got back to the top. If it wasn't for George Hallis, these players would be playing, these coaches would be coaches and they wouldn't be making the kind of money they're making. He was a great coach. And then he was a winner. He was a giant in his times. There was nobody to, to compare with him.